doing? Yeah, not bad, all right, okay. Good to see you here. Today, as we remember, think about Memorial Day, the memory of those who have fallen for this country, most for what it used to stand for, most for what we hope that it would stand for now, most for what we believe in. It's one nation under God, because He is sovereign, whether people like that or not, or realize that or not. And it is because of those men and women that answered the call of this country to go and stand and to fight, and those that gave their lives, that we have the freedom, and we still have the freedom, to sit here this morning and to proclaim that our Lord Jesus Christ reigns. And whether or not we see a country that, that, that still follows the examples that our forefathers put before us, of putting God first, God is still sovereign, and he protects this freedom. And we thank those that gave that sacrifice for us to be here today. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning and we, th- we thank you, Lord, because you made this freedom possible. Because you were the first to go and die on the cross so that men might be free. In ways that many don't understand. That we have that freedom in you, Lord Jesus, to stand here. And we remember those that, that fought for that, that died for that. And we lift up to you this morning, Lord, the families of those that have lost loved ones, that have sacrificed the loved ones for the freedom that we have. We pray, Lord, that you be with them. Many of them know you, some don't, Lord. We pray that you comfort those who know you and reassure them that their loved ones are with you, those that know you. Lord, those that don't, that you would come to them in a way that they would know for certain that it is you and that freedom can be had in trust and belief in you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that you would see fit to give us a place, a country, a state, a building where we can come and praise you. Do it openly and freely. And we do this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles to uh, 1 Thessalonians. We will be in chapter 2. Last week, as we looked at this, we spent our time talking about the Word of God, mostly, and how that we know that it is His Word. All Scripture is given by God. God breathed. God inspired. And that Paul and Peter and and Moses and all those guys were really nothing more than just a pen in the hand of the Holy Spirit, putting down the words that we see before us in their original languages, preserved by God for us. So that he could show us and tell us who he is. He's always the the, the main character. It's all always about him. And the point is to show us who he is. His love for us. His sovereignty. His nature. His character. So that we don't have to go around guessing and wondering who God is and what he's like. It's him revealing himself to us. I'm very thankful that he does that. He says, here I am. I go back and we think about Adam and Eve in the garden after the fall, and it wasn't God that hid from them. He didn't say, oh, you sinned, let me turn away. It was them that hid from God. And even then he made it possible to have fellowship. Because he wants us to know him for certain. And to trust in him. He's given his word and preserved his word and put it in a a form that we can read and understand now. And as we open up this book that we have before us, it's more than just ink on pages. It is the word of God, the very word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as we do now. 
We open up this Word of God, this Bible before us, and He speaks to us directly through His Word, through His Holy Spirit. We hear Him. And we can trust Him and His Word. That it is trustworthy and accurate. God never said, oops. Most of us have. God never said, oops. God never said, scratch that. God said, oops, sorry, I didn't mean that. We have his word here before us to raise us up, to nurture us, to nourish us, to train us up in godliness, to equip us for all good works, the Bible tells us, so that we might know him. And we thank God for that, for his word. And as we get into his word, his word gets into us, doesn't it? It transforms and changes us by the renewing of our mind. How many of you think like you did before you got saved? It's a good thing, isn't it? (laughs) That renewing of the mind, oh boy. We thank the Lord for that. That we can be partakers of his nature and let the mind of Christ be in us. Remember a few years back, well, it's been more than a few years back. Remember those bracelets that everybody had, the WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, we can have a pretty good idea, can't we? Because we see who he is. Let's continue. Chapter 2, we'll pick up in verse 17 today. Paul says, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence not in heart, endeavor more eagerly to see you face, to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and time again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. Paul expresses his desire to go and to see them, how he just had a, his heart was set on them. He wanted to go. And things kept getting in the way for whatever reasons he didn't get there. It says that Satan hindered him, even with this desire that he had. Even Paul himself, he says, you know, I wanted to come, not just send people, I wanted to come to you and to see you. I think about how we go through our week sometimes and we don't get to see one another and we look forward to Sunday mornings and seeing you guys sitting out there and I know where each and every one of you are going to be. You all sit in the same places. You guys all, you get, you know. <laughs> it's fun. And yet when, when Warren's not there, when there are those few that are missing and everything, it, 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 we miss their presence. And yet as we come together and we pray for them in that that time of prayer in the morning before service, we pray for folks, we see that they're not here, and our our heart is there with them as we share that that kindred spirit, that life that we share for one another, and a desire for them in fellowship. And we pray, oh Lord, I hope they're doing all right, because we sure miss them here. It's good to have Darlene here. She might be way over. By the way, Texas called. They're closed. You can't go back. (laughs) Not in our presence, but our hearts are always, always there, always together in that desire. And this eagerness to go and see them. They wanted to time and time again. He says there's something interesting. He says, but Satan hindered them. As we read through the book of Acts, we see that they were led by the Lord and that there was times that they wanted to go someplace and he says that the Holy Spirit forbid it. That the door just wouldn't open. And now we look at this and he says, well, Satan's hindering. Well, what power does he have? How does he get in the way? I can tell you this, that if God wants that door open, that Satan can't close it. We often wonder what Satan's doing and why he's here. I've gone, Lord, why don't you just get him out of here? You know, I knew a guy that used to pray for Satan's salvation. I don't know that that makes sense, but whatever. <laughs> you know, and just be done with this whole thing. And, and while the, the reality of that whole relationship and how that works and everything is something that the Lord understands, I don't. You might. I don't know. But God is sovereign, isn't he? 
No matter what happens, no matter what goes on, we talk about our country and, and our politicians and all that stuff. And whether or not we personally like the person that's sitting up there in that, that Oval Office and everything like that, God's still sovereign, isn't He? And He put them there. That might be kind of a bummer to some of us, but you know what? God, God knows what He's doing. And we don't. Not always. But we learn to know and to trust Him and to trust His sovereignty. We talk about our nation, about our soldiers, about our warriors, and those enemies. And yet the Bible tells us, us as believers, us as Christians, that we don't fight against flesh and blood. That man, that person, that soldier from the other side is not the real enemy, but against the devil. And yet we read in the Bible that the Lord's already defeated him and that he is a defeated foe. And so what's up with that? I don't know. But I know this, that God is sovereign. And while Satan does what Satan does, he does not do it behind God's back without his knowing, without his control. Look in Job chapter 1 with me. I know you know this, but it's always good to be reminded, isn't it? Because some of those days when you're wondering, Lord, what's going on? Where are you at? What's happening? It's good to be reminded. Job chapter 1. Back in the 60s and the 70s when a lot of the hippies were getting saved and everything, they didn't like this book because it said job, and they didn't want one. (laughs) Maybe not. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the face on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it, wandering around. Okay. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the the subject of that conversation between Satan and the Lord. I'll be the second most godly guy. (laughs) You know? Because we know what happens after this. The Lord in His sovereignty says that Satan, His stuff is in your hands, in your power. But God is still sovereign, isn't He? He's in control. Satan says, yeah, you got your heads of protection around him and all that other stuff. But take away some of that stuff and see what happens. God knowing that Job's faith was not in the stuff that he had, but in the Lord he served. He goes on and his, his, his fields are wiped out, his livestock is wiped out, and everything that he has is wiped out, and even his children are wiped out. Job says, Naked I came and came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. For the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with any wrong. It's kind of a hard situation, a tough place to be in. Now let me tell you this, if you're going to read the book of Job, read all of it. Because it gets good at the end. In between, there's some crazy stuff. 
Chapter 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came, <coughs> came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, Where do you come from? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, until he holds fast to, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you enticed me against him to destroy him without cause? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. Stretch out your hand now and touch him, his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd, with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Job's response in here is, is later on. He said, Lord, even though the Lord slay me still, I will trust him. Job is the greatest example that we see of trusting the Lord completely. No matter what, letting go of the things of the world, sitting there in a pile of ashes, scraping off the boils and the, the sores and stuff that was on him with a potsherd. And his wife, the one who should have been alongside him no matter what. Curse God and die, Job. Just get it over with, man. Job wouldn't do it because he trusted the Lord and realized and understood that God was sovereign. And whatever the Lord was doing, whatever he was up to, that he could trust in his love for him. And then his friends come along and try to help. <laughs> that gets a little tricky. But in the end, we know the deal, right? The Lord comes and he restores Job and everything there. The Lord's got a plan in everything, in every life whether we understand it or even enjoy it. And we know that we can trust Him. And that Satan is still under His sovereign power and does nothing outside of God's will. Look at Luke chapter 22 with me. Verse 31. We know the story here, Peter and the boys, people coming after him, Peter boasting about his devotion to the Lord and all of that. In verse 31 it says, the Lord said to Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. And the Lord said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three time, deny three times that you know me. Satan came and he asked permission to sift him like wheat. He said, well, let me shake Peter up and see what happens then. The guy's following, he said, no matter what, no matter where, he's right there. Oh, I might forsake you, Lord, I won't. Well, Peter, you don't understand, man. There's things going on that you can't see. There's things going on that, that, that you don't know about. But don't worry, Peter. Don't worry, Peter. 
Because the Lord's got it. The Lord's sovereign. And His love will reign. Satan comes in and, and, and does what he can. But he doesn't do anything outside of God's sovereignty. He's a defeated foe. It's when we step outside of God's will, when we stop following Him, when we get our eyes off of the Lord, that Satan gets up to his tricks, that he trips us up, that he stumbles us, that we fall, that we get beat up sometimes. It's when we get out of outside of God's will that we fall down, that we get in the flesh. And any time we step into the flesh, the enemy can pound on us. He can't take away our salvation. He can't steal that away from us. But boy, I tell you what, he can certainly mess up your walk and bring you into a place where you, so, you were like that prodigal son, wishing you had some pig pods to eat. It can sure make life miserable. It can sure, sure ruin your witness and destroy your, your walk. And bring you to a place so far away from the Lord where you wonder what ever happened. And that's when we take our will in our own hands and do what we want to. Following the Lord, we trust Him completely. James chapter 4, I know you know this, but let's read it again. Verse 7, it says, Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You notice the order of those things there, don't you? Submit to God. We see the example of Job. Job was submitted to, to the Lord. We see the Peter and Peter was, well, you know, he, wanted to, he was ready to go and do anything, but he was looking at his flesh more than he was at the Lord. The Lord said, that's all right, it'll be okay. You'll fall, but you'll get back up. Submit to the Lord. That's our first step, our first place, the first thing that we need to check, that we ought to check. Are we submitted truly to the Lord? Are we submitted completely to the Lord? And then are we resisting? Are we resisting the devil? Are we resisting the enemy? Are we resisting the temptation? Because that's where the Satan comes in with it, is the temptations. It's not all the mean, ugly, nasty things that we like to pin on him. We all like that little picture of the devil, that little red dude with the horns and the tail and the spear and everything like that. If he was actually like that, it would be real easy to spot him. Hey, you're the devil, get out of here. The Bible doesn't mention anything at all like that. In fact, the Bible tells us that he comes masquerading. And it's a masquerade, it's because it's not true, because he's really not. But he comes masquerading as an angel of light. And as emissaries, as ministers of the gospel. Satan don't show up in all those mean, ugly, nasty things that we think that, he, that, that are, are there. Although he does. When people that don't know him, that are out in the world, follow him completely, it gets mean, nasty, and ugly. But that's easy, the spot. It's those wolves in sheep's clothing, those things that look so good, that seem so right. That get us off track. That get us tripped up. That hinder us from following the Lord completely. That lead us astray. That get us back into the flesh. Satan didn't tempt Eve with anything other than a desire to please God. Twisted. And that's often the deception that he uses. The Bible tells us that he's like a roaring lion walking around looking to, to see who he could devour. Little lambs. And little lambs that, that when they stay close to the master, stay close to the flock, he doesn't even bother with them. It's when they wander off and they go astray. The Bible says we all do. That means us too. We go astray and there's that roaring lion. Roar, chomp. 
He might not eat us all up, but he can sure chew us up and spit us out, can he? When we get off, when we get in the wrong place, when we wander off, that roaring lion. And even at that, that roaring lion, it's kind of easy to spot. You hear the roar, you run, right? You hope. Some sometimes saints that get chewed up. You know what I mean, the sometimes saints. They're saints on Sunday. Sometimes. And the rest of the time they're just out there in the world. Doing whatever the world does. Looking just like the world. He's a deceiver. Deceiving people in every way possible. A counterfeiter. I guess nowadays, do they, they, you ever notice that our, our money, our currency keeps changing? I think every time I get hold, I, you know, I don't carry a lot of cash anymore because everything's on a card. Every time I get hold of a new, new bill of some sort, a new 20 or something like that, I'm like, what in the world is this thing? It doesn't look like the last one did. They've changed them up. Well, they have to do that because the counterfeiters are getting so good that they've got to try to stay one step ahead of them. And Satan's a deceiver, a counterfeiter. Whatever the Lord does, he throws a counterfeit in there. That looks really close to the same thing, but not quite. There are some telltale things, those watermarks or those bloodstains, if you will, of Christ that show the difference. He's a counterfeiter, a liar. Boy, some lies sound real good, don't they? Some lies just almost suck you right in. Some lies are just almost true. Almost. Not quite. I'll tell you what, kids, kids, well, not just kids, people. Kids learn how to do it pretty well. Kids learn how to tell almost the whole truth. To try and worm their way out of different situations. Adults get better at it. You tell almost the whole truth. So it sounds pretty good to get yourself off the hook. Satan, that liar, that deceiver, tells almost the whole truth, but not quite. To deceive us, to get us off. And how do we know? By knowing the truth. By knowing the truth. When you know the truth, that almost the whole truth doesn't quite cut it. An accuser, an accuser of the brethren. And we know that he accuses us before the Lord. And the Lord says, yeah, they're guilty because we are. But we're covered because we're his. But that accuser of the brethren, that one that puts doubt in your hearts and your minds about things. About your own walk, about your own salvation about your own relationship with the Lord. That, little, that one that says, you know, yeah, you think yourself, you call yourself a Christian, look at you, you know what you did. We've all been there. That accuser of the brethren. And yet in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, you guys find I read this a lot because I don't know about you, but I need to be reminded. He tempts us. The temptations of the flesh. The Lord doesn't do it. Satan does. He tempts us to do wrong, to do evil. Verse 12, he says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Never think you got it covered. Always trust in the Lord. Because he does. You don't. Verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. But God is faithful. It's things that we should always remember. God is sovereign. God is faithful. And He loves you. With an everlasting love. You'll not allow temptation beyond what you are able to withstand. But with the temptation will make a way of escape that you are able to bear it. 
There's always a way out. God's always in charge. God's always faithful. Even though you see things where, where things happen like the story of Job and the things that happen in his life to a just and a righteous man. And our response would be, God, why me? God says, because I could trust you in your faith. Because you had your eyes on me. We go through this life, we go through this world, and there's a lot of things that we would want to do. Godly things that we would want to do. Paul and the boys wanted to go see the church at Thessalonica. Where they, yeah, that's where they're at. To raise them up, to exhort them. Here was this young church, and he said, man, they were, they were concerned about them. And they wanted to come and come alongside them and raise them up. We talked about Paul showing that father's heart for this young church. Showing his father's heart for that young church. And the desire was there to go and do this. But they were hindered. They were stopped. They were messed up. The Lord didn't open the door. Satan did his tricks to hinder them. Sometimes those things are good and godly things that we want to go do. We've got to trust the Lord to open those doors. Satan will trip us up. And say, no, 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 don't go do that. Go over here and do this. That's kind of godly, isn't it? Maybe, maybe not. But is it what God wants you to do? Is it God's will? Following Him. He said, Satan hindered us, and he does that in so many different ways. Ways that we don't often see. Ways that we don't always know about. Ways that surprise us. I've often made the statement that you... Some of them horror movies, you know, Friday the 13th stuff, Freddy Krueger and whatnot. People look at that and say, oh God, that's horrible. Demonic stuff. That's man's imagination. Touched by an angel is demonic. Because it would lead you to believe that you could get to heaven apart from Jesus Christ. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. But boy, it looks sweet, doesn't it? It'll make you feel good, pump you up, and fluff you up. Right straight to hell. Because no one comes through the Father except through the Son. Paul goes on to say in verse 19, he says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. Come back to Paul and his heart for these people and his love for them. And his desire to be there. Yeah, Satan's tripping them up and doing all that stuff. But as we read on, we'll find out that God opens the door, at least for Timothy to go. To go and to reach out and, and reassure. To come alongside these people because of the tribulation and the things that they were going through. But he was their joy. We rejoice in other people's blessings and other people's salvation. One of the things that, 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 I, that I like is when you read in the scripture that when somebody gets saved that all the angels are celebrating and having a party. And it's a great thing. And sometimes I, I wonder sometimes at my own reaction and the reaction of other believers when somebody comes and we pray with somebody and they accept the Lord and we go, all right, now you're saved, that's nice. What about our response? Shouldn't we be going, all right, Yeah! Where's the party and the celebration for us? And I know that part of it is because we've become skeptical of those that just say the prayer. We go, all right, yeah, you said the prayer, now let's watch you. Make sure it takes. Where's the celebration? Where's the joy in others and their salvation? Where's the joy in others and their walk with the Lord? We rejoice at our blessing. We rejoice at at our walk with the Lord and our fellowship with Him. But what about somebody else's? It's the reason it's on Sunday nights that we like to share our praise reports, man. To hear what God's doing so we can rejoice in the things of the Lord together. We come and we share our prayer requests about all the things that are are gone wrong in, in in the world and in our lives. And that's important because we should share those things together and come alongside one another. But where's the rejoicing and the blessing of others? When the Lord comes and blesses us with some great blessing, man, we come in here, oh man, look what the Lord did for me, this is great. All right, that's good. 
When's the last time we saw somebody come in and say, hey, man, you got to check this out. The Lord really did that. Lord did with Danny and the, the, the wheel on his thing. That was great, man. You got, that was cool. I like that. The Lord blessed him and the rest of us went, yeah. Well, on email anyhow. I don't know how, that, how you email that. Was, they, got, they got a thing probably to, to do on that, you know. But rejoicing in that. And the joy in somebody else's salvation. I think sometimes we miss that, don't we? The rejoicing and the joy for somebody else's salvation, for somebody else's walk with the Lord, for somebody else's relationship. The rejoicing and the joy that comes from seeing someone grow in the Lord. And that desire to go and to pour out, to pour our lives into somebody. Look at Paul's desire for this church. Every time Paul went someplace, something happened that wasn't good. Physically. But the Lord worked and the Lord moved. Paul wanted to go and see what was going on with these guys and see what the Lord was doing with them. He didn't care about himself. His heart was for them. They were his joy. They were the thing that he rejoiced about. This was the crown, if you will. Their salvation, part because of our society and part because of our selfishness, we look, tend to look at what the Lord's doing for us. And our relationship with Him becomes our crown and our joy and our focus is on that. Paul had a heart for the church in Thessalonica. He couldn't get there and it bugged him. It bugged him. It bothered him. And as we'll read on, we're not going to read on today because it's time. We'll read on as we'll find out that, that it bugged him to the point where it was just a, a torment to him. How are they doing? How are they holding up? Are they trusting the Lord? Have they got their eyes fixed on, on them? The example of esteeming others as more valuable than yourself. We do that well when it benefits us also. But what about when it costs us? We talk about Memorial Day. And there have been many soldiers that were soldiers because they had no choice. There have been many soldiers that were soldiers and fought and didn't know the Lord. They gave their life for some ideal. And there have been many soldiers that went and did what they did because they knew that that was the call that the Lord had put on their life and they did it to the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ so that we could sit in this freedom that we have now. They esteemed others, you and I, more valuable than themselves and followed the example of our Lord Jesus Christ in giving themselves for others that they might be saved. Paul's heart is the heart of the Lord poured out for these people because their salvation meant more to him than anything. Their joy meant more than his. Their well-being meant more than his. Paul shows us the heart of God here and his desire for these people and rejoicing in their salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that we see your heart so clearly, that great love that you have. Lord, that there's many things, and Satan does his best to hinder us, Lord, but he's just, You're sovereign. You're sovereign, Lord, in ways that we don't understand, through tribulations that we may not know how to deal with. But no matter what, Lord, we trust in you because you gave it all for us so that we might have life in you because you esteemed us more highly than your own self. As you came and died on the cross that we might have salvation and in that you rejoice and you have joy. And Father, I pray that we would have the heart that you have, the heart that Paul shows us in rejoicing in others in their salvation, in their joy. Give us your heart, Lord Jesus, that we might esteem others 
more valuable than ourselves.